Good morning, church family. If nobody else loves you, I love you like crazy. I am so glad that we get to worship God together today. Today is special. We have a guest preacher. The guest preacher is my dad, and it's gonna, he's going to be fantastic. I'm so glad you get to hear my dad preach. I grew up feasting on God's word as delivered from this man. And so I hope that, that you will just um, grow as a result of the message this morning. He has all kinds of credentials, a doctorate in ministry, and is pastored. And, but the most important thing is, He's my dad, and you're going to be blessed. We also have guest worship leaders today. I think probably about over here is Donna, and she's leading worship today. Everybody say, hi, Donna. Go on, say it. Hi, Donna. And then over here is Caleb, and he's leading the band. Everybody say, hi, Caleb. All right, enough, enough silliness. Stand up, stand up, stand up, and let's worship God. I love you. Pastor David likes for you to stand for the reading of God's word, and so you will, but not now. Have a seat. I preached last week at a uh, small church in Hemet. Uh, the pastor was absent. He'd arranged for a member of the congregation to give a testimony in his absence. Now, you may not be familiar with the word testimony if you haven't gone to a Baptist church all your life. But testimony just means telling what God's done for you. So uh, that's what uh, he'd asked. And uh, evidently, he did not give a whole lot of instruction about this. Now, Pastor David uses testimonies. You may have noticed that uh, during a sermon. He gives very specific instructions. <laughs> he wants to know how long you're going to talk, and he'll tell you, no, that's too long. And then he will want to know what you're going to say, and then he will say, write it down, because I'm going to look at it first. So anyway, <laughs> uh, this pastor hadn't done anything crazy like that. He just uh, asked some guy to get up and give testimony, evidently. And the poor guy got up, and he first thing he announced was that uh, he, he was not really adept at public speaking. Well, <laughs> after 15 minutes of wandering through the desert of his mind, <laughs> we would all have agreed with his statement. But finally, at some point, he... He arrived, he'd gone through a bunch of his life by now. Um, you know, some people just talk until they find something to say. <laughs> you may have heard a sermon like that. Hope, that, hope that's not this one. <laughs> anyway, so finally he arrived at the point where Jesus saved him, and he thought that was a good place to stop. We all agreed. He sat down to his relief and ours. And then it was the preacher's job to get up and try to resurrect the service. So... Sometimes when I hear a testimony like that, I really want to say something kind of rude. What I want to say is something like, so Jesus saved you, what's happened lately? What's happened in your walk with God lately? Was that where, when it ended at that point? What's going on in your, your, your Christian walk? Are you sure you're still saved? Now, despite appearances to the contrary, I usually try to be polite, so I don't say that to them, but I'm going to say it to you. <laughs> I'm going to ask you, so you've trusted Jesus at some point in your past, you've given him the leadership of your life, you have made him Lord, which is a fancy word we don't use here in the colonies that much, but uh, it's a word that really means the boss, and you made him the boss of your life. You've trusted him as having died for your sins. He's your savior. You did all of that once upon a time. Are you still saved? Are you still saved? Now, I want to direct this to those who can say, I had that experience at some point in my life. If you did not, this sermon is not for you because this is a sermon about assurance and you have none. However, at the end of the service, we'll give you a chance to make that right before you go. So you don't have to go hopeless into the world. But the rest of this is for those who say, I had that experience. I prayed to receive Jesus. I, I know that he, he's my Lord and Savior. Oh, what's been going on lately? What's been going And you know, the problem is we all know, you know, you're imperfect, right? 
Is there anybody here so delusional to say I'm, I'm perfect? We want to know who the delusional people are because we want to watch out for them as we leave. <laughs> Make sure they have no sharp objects, things like that. You know, there are times when you've blown it in your walk with the Lord, right? We all have. Maybe a, a time like that you have, uh, you've, you've almost sensed the hot breath of Satan on the little hairs at the back of your neck as he whispered in your ear, so you're a Christian. After what you did, after what you said, after the language you used, you call yourself a Christian. If you ever were a Christian, you must have lost it now. See, the devil likes to say things like that. Well, can you lose your place, really? As a member of God's family, are you sure you're still saved? Well, that's enough of that. It probably would help a whole lot to look what Jesus had to say at the, on the subject. So, now you can stand. And, oh, we got PowerPoint. We didn't have PowerPoint earlier today. All right. Take a look at John 10, verses 27 through 30. John 10 is an amazing passage of Scripture. A preacher could spend a good part of his life just preaching through this passage. Of Scripture, We're just going to look at verses 27 through 30, and we won't get to explore all of the great stuff in there even at that. But I do want to think about, are you still saved? And look what Jesus said. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. You may be seated. I'm not going to preach on the last verse because I wouldn't have time to, for anything else. But every once in a while I would hear some uninformed person who who's, uh, has opinions about the Bible evidently without having read it. And they will say something grandly stupid like, Jesus never claimed to be God. I and the Father are one. Keep that in mind the next time you hear somebody make a grandly stupid statement like that. Because they just don't know what they're saying. Sometimes people will say something to me like, oh, well, I don't need organized religion. I just try to live the Sermon on the Mount. And I think, really? You know what that says? Matthew 5, 48, be therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. So if you can pull that off, fine. <laughs> Most of us need a little bit more grace than that. <laughs> All right. So are you still saved? Well, let's answer this by asking five other questions. Now, take heart. I actually finished early in the last service. If you get too emotional, it might take longer. <laughs> But the first question I have for you, Jesus compared his disciples to sheep. How do sheep stay safe anyway? It's interesting to me that Jesus chose to call his disciples sheep because sheep are just incredibly stupid. And they will get themselves lost, they will wander off the path, they will fall in a ditch, they'll fall into a crevice. Uh, all kinds of bad things happen to sheep when they're left to their own devices. Sort of like people. <laughs> so we are indeed like sheep. Left to our own devices, we are in trouble. If all we have is what we can reason out. God help us from our own reasoning. Who keeps the sheep safe? It's the shepherd that keeps the sheep safe. It's not the other way around. The sheep aren't protecting a shepherd. The shepherd's protecting the sheep. The Psalm 23rd, uh, 23 is one of the most beloved of all psalms, and perhaps the verse that's quoted most often, and we especially quote it uh, at the time of a loss or uh, of a loved one and so on, it says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. What I want you to notice especially, though, are the next words. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, sometimes we quote that and we don't really know what the rod and the staff are. Well, let's start with the staff. That's the easy one. The shepherd would have used this as a walking stick, Corda. It's sort of like a long, 
You know, if you hike, sometimes hikers have a, a nice big long um, hiking stick. I've got one of those. I try to avoid hiking, but you know, I have the equipment. <laughs> I know where it is in the garage. But this is a particular stick. It isn't just used for that. At the end of it, it has this crook which is a fancy word for a hook, it just has more letters. And so it has this crook at the end, and what does he use it for? He uses it for when the sheep start to get into trouble. They're about to wander off the path, they're about to wander into the ditch or whatever, and he reaches out with this thing, and he pulls them back to safety. So that's to protect the sheep from falling to their own devices. What's the other thing? The rod... Well, it was actually just a club. And this club was not used on the sheep. This club was used on any kind of a wild animal that might attack the sheep. It was to beat off those dangers from the outside. And so he had something to help them with the inside stuff, their own stupidity. And he had something to protect them from the enemy. And that's the shepherd. Moreover, and this we find a little earlier in this 10th chapter of John, the shepherd often put himself, well, always put himself, between danger and the flock. Uh, I went to Israel some years back, and uh, after we finished at the Church of the uh, Nativity, which, by the way, doesn't resemble anything like the first century, but what is, what is probably the truest part of it is that if you go down to the area where... They say Jesus was born. There's this church, and then there's this hallway. You go down a little lower. Uh, they made it look like anything but what it was. But what it was was a cave. And I had a roommate uh, for my trip who was an Episcopal priest who had been there many times, and he said, well, you don't want to see what this looked like before they did all this to it? And I said, sure. Well, there's another church right next door. They really like churches there. Anyway, so we go over there and we go down in the basement and there was cave after cave after cave unadorned. Bethlehem is full of caves all around it. And when we left that area, we got on our tour bus and we went outside Jerusalem just a little ways and we went to the shepherd's field. Actually, that's what they call it, the shepherd's field. And uh, we, we saw this great expanse where the sheep would feed and so on. And then at night, they would go into the sheepfold. They had a very particular sheepfold in Bethlehem. The sheepfold was a cave. And the shepherd would lead his sheep into that cave. And, you know, we all went into the cave too, and we're, so we're standing around talking. And I asked the tour guide, I said, now, did the shepherd, and I'm sure he's heard this probably hundreds of times, the same question. Did the shepherd then lay down in the opening to the cave? He says, exactly right. The shepherd became the door to the sheepfold. Exactly what Jesus said in, in John 10. Nothing got out and nothing got in without going through the shepherd. The shepherd put his very self uh, in, the, uh, in the place to give safety to his sheep. Now, Jesus was the good shepherd. And he guards our very souls with his own life. Now the second question I have for you regarding are you still saved? Well, let me ask you this. How long is eternal anyway? Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and I give them 20 years of life with me. A few months, put them on probation. What does he say? I give them eternal life. How long is eternal anyway? Eternal actually refers to the nature of God. God is from everlasting to everlasting. It's His nature. He's without end. When we become a part of the family of God, that's our nature. We're eternal in a relationship with Him. If you've been given eternal life by Jesus, then let me ask you, What's the expiration date? Our daughter Karen, uh, she hasn't done this lately, but I expect it'll happen again anytime, because used to, she would periodically come over to our house, she would go through our medicine cabinets, she would look at the expiration date on all these bottles of medicine and throw away the ones that were, you know, 
seven, eight years old. She thought they were no good anymore. I don't know. I tried to tell her, it's okay, just not as strong. <laughs> and she would throw those things away. Then she'd go to the refrigerator of all the nerve. And she would do the same thing. And she would look for food that had an expiration date. And she would throw it away. And I'd say, well, it's in a jar. It's fine. <laughs> you know? And she'd throw it away because of the expiration date. So what's the expiration date that's printed in, in the invisible ink that only God can read that's on your forehead? When do you expire? Well, we know that we will all expire in this life, but when do you expire eternally? Hmm. Because you have eternal life, Jesus said you will never perish. What part of never do you not understand? Never perish. There's no expiration date. This salvation business just keeps going on and on. Even beyond this life, I have an eternal relationship as a member of the family of God. Got another question for you. See, they go pretty fast, right? You keeping up? I can always stop for a while if you need to catch up. Okay, that, you, you seem like you want me to proceed. I have never known anybody to get mad because the sermon was too short. <laughs> question three. So whose grip is it that really keeps you saved? When I was a student at uh, California Baptist, it was then college. Now it's a great university. But when I was a student there, I can recall a conversation with a, a, another fellow. He, he was a member of a, a, a church that was a little different than what I was used to, a lot different. For one thing, they taught something called sinless perfection. Sinless perfection teaches that you can be uh, perfectly sinless before God. So I was having this conversation with this student, and Andrew said, you know, I, I, I believe that, you know, in, in sinless perfection, I believe that we can be, live a life without sin. And I said, but none of us are perfect. None of us are perfect. We all sin at some time. And then Andrew assured me, well, I do believe I can live a life without sin. And at that moment, I realized his definition of sin had to be incredibly narrow. Maybe paper thin, actually. And my definition of sin is like any rebellion against God. Any time that I'm acting outside of what God wants me to do. And I find I'm perfectly capable of sin. I find everybody in the Bible was perfectly capable of sin. Even the good guys. We're capable of sin. The only one in the Bible who experienced sinless perfection was Jesus Christ himself. He was tempted in all points just like we are, the scripture says, yet without sin. I don't see that said about anybody else. Well, people really can't pull that off, but Jesus can. Now, my grip, because I can't pull it off, my grip on Jesus might be kind of slippery at times. Jesus' grip on me, though, that's an entirely different matter. His grip is strong. His grip is unwavering. He holds me tightly in His hand. Have you ever shaken hands with somebody that had a really strong grip? And you came away and said, wow, what a, what a grip, what a grip. Jesus has a strong grip. His grasp cannot be pried apart. It's His grip and not mine that keeps me saved. And the same thing is true of you. If ever you have been saved, then you are saved, and His grip keeps you saved. He holds on to that which belongs to Him. Now, why is that important? Because it'll keep you from going crazy. <laughs> My late wife, Sharon, uh, told me about a friend of hers. Actually, I had met him but in adulthood. But she had grown up with him. I think they even attended the same elementary school. And uh, Billy was part of a, a family in a church that believed that if you thought wrong, that was sin, and all sin would result in you losing your salvation. And, you know, he did the best he could, and then puberty hit. And he found that God had created these wonderful creatures called girls. 
And he found it was hard for him not to think about girls. And I know a few girls that can say the same thing the other way about boys, you know. This, this thing just happens, right? And you, you can't keep it from happening. You can, you can keep some things happening based on what you've thought about, but uh, you're, you're going to have thoughts. And he felt his grip on Jesus had slipped and that he had fallen from grace and that he was no longer a Christian because there were now girls that he thought about. Billy had a nervous breakdown. If you know that it's God's grip on you that keeps you saved and not your own slippery, slidey grip, it'll keep you from going nuts. It really will. How much peace of mind is sacrificed to bad theology? <laughs> That's some bad theology. Well, I got another question for you. What would it take for you to be separated from the love of God and lose your salvation? What would it take? Since your salvation is secured by, by the mighty hand of God, as we've seen, there's nothing really in all creation that can tear you away from God's love. It's not me that's securing my salvation, it's God who secures it. Now, I really love this passage from Romans 8, where Paul expounds on this same theme. Uh, Romans 8, 35-39. Is that in your insert handout? I don't... Okay, great. So I want you to have that passage. The Apostle Paul writes there, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, it's a fancy word for trouble, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it's written, for your sake we are being killed all day long, we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Then he goes on, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, for I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing in all creation. Now sometimes somebody will say something to me, well, you can do it yourself. And I say, are you part of creation? Are you a created being? Are you something from outer space? You know, I am a created being as part of that creation, and there's nothing in all creation that can separate me from His love. I can't even separate myself from Him loving me. If you're a parent, you can identify with this. If you're not, just go along with me. If you have kids, and they're good kids, praise God. I've, I was given two wonderful kids, and they each had four wonderful grandchildren among the very best in the world, and I'll argue this with you. But at any rate... If I had had an incorrigible kid who was always in trouble, who disgraced the family name, who did all kinds of stuff, that broke my heart, that would not keep that kid from being my child. It would mean that we would not have a very good relationship. It would mean I would not be able to bless that child the way I want to bless that child. And if the child's young enough, it would mean... Well, I'm from the, you know, the world where we actually spanked. But it would be, at the very least, I would find out some way to discipline that child because I love the child and I don't let them to, want them to grow up being a, a, a wild caveman or cavewoman. Right? Well, the Bible says God chastens those whom He loves. I could cite example after example after example, but there's one character in the Old Testament who's described as a man after God's own heart. Now, some of you know, what's that name? David. King David is described as a man after God's own heart. And uh, David was such a wonderful character, right? An adulterer, a murderer. You know, when Bathsheba got pregnant, he was ruthless in how he eliminated. We tried to do a cover-up first, and that didn't work. And then he covered up the sin by having her husband killed in battle. What a scary, scary thing. 
and God convicted him of it. There's a place when the prophet of God went to talk to David, and he used a parable. He talked about a man who was rich, who had lots of sheep, and his neighbor just had one little pet sheep. And when there was time for a feast, this is a great story. You need to get the whole thing, not the short version I'm giving you. But there was a time for a feast, and the rich man went and stole the poor man's sheep and slaughtered it to, to serve, even though he had whole flocks. And David said, the man who did this shall die. And Nathan, the prophet of God, boy, I could just see this moment. He pointed his finger to David and said, you are the man. I imagine there was a terrible stillness before the throne of King David as he realized what he had done. In Psalm 51, David pleads with God for forgiveness, and he says to him, Restore to me. Your salvation? That's not what he said. He said, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Because of the sin in my own life, it has come between me and you, and I'm not being blessed, and I don't have joy in it anymore. He didn't say he had lost the salvation, but he had sure lost the joy. And sometimes we get so far away from hearing the voice of God, we get so far astray that we lose the joy he wants us to have. And we need to start listening to his voice again. How can you listen to the voice of God? Well, fortunately, he's given us a book that's filled with his stuff. Right? And if you uh, want the short version of it, read the Gospels and learn what Jesus is like. And Jesus said, I and the Father are one. So that means if you really want to know what God is like, find out what Jesus is like. That's what God's like. Get to know His voice by reading His book and have a growing experience as you walk with God and you start applying the things that He has shown you. Pray to Him, talk with Him. Just try to have a good marriage and never talk to your mate. That's not going to work, and you know that. Just try to have a good relationship with God, and the only time He hears from you is, Lord, help me out. Now, He wants to hear you ask for help when you need it, but He also wants to hear you say, Father, I love you. Thank you for this that you did. Thank you for that. Give me your guidance. He wants to hear you just talk with Him. Do so, and you'll find yourself an increasingly close walk with God is you cultivate that habit daily. God wants you to have assurance. He wants you to have the peace of mind that you have when you recognize that you are actually part of the family of God. And when you become part of the family of God, it is a forever family. I am so glad I'm part of the family of God, and I'm glad there's no expiration date on that. I'm glad it's eternal. I'm glad that Jesus said, that those who belong to Him have eternal life and will never perish. Never, by the way, is the other side of eternal. I'm glad for all of that. He wants you to have that relationship because He wants you to have peace with God and peace of mind within. He wants you to have the fullness of life that only He can give. I'm looking... Okay, let's go to the last slide. Can you read that? If you can't read that, it's also in your bulletin insert. Please stand. We're going to say this together. And we're going to do it as a, uh, a prayer of thanksgiving. Now, the fact we're going to say it together means when I start talking, you talk too. <laughs> now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Oh, there's that forever word. Forever. Perhaps you're here today and you need to get something straightened in your life so you can again experience the joy of salvation and and we give you an opportunity to do that. If God's calling you to come up here and pray, the, the altar's open to you. Uh, 
eventually, it takes me a little while to get that up and down the steps, but eventually I'll be right here. And we have, I think we're going to have somebody over here. Yes, there's Pastor Grover. And we're going to have, and there's Lonnie over here. So we have folks over here that can pray with you as well if you'd like to go to the side. This is your time to respond. And I don't really like to try to guess how the Holy Spirit's moving in your life. But if the Holy Spirit's moving in your life, I don't have to guess because you already know. You see, if you're being tugged to make some kind of decision for God, that only came from one place. The devil never does that. He hates it when, when that happens. But if you're being tugged to come and pray to get something right, whatever it is, that comes from the Holy Spirit of God. And you just need to say yes and respond. Now, I did say we'd give you a chance if, if you can't look back to that event in your life where you received Jesus. Uh, birth is an event. By the way, my co-teacher in Experiencing God is Mary King, and I got a text at 2.19 this morning. Uh, Mary said, I'm headed to the hospital, and I think my water broke. Yeah, see, I was counting her to teach experience of God this morning, right? But God had other plans, and sometimes that happens. See, the experience in God people know you have to learn to adjust to God, right? <laughs> and so we adjust. We adjust. But uh, birth is an event. It's an event that may take a little while, depending on how long childbirth takes, but it is an event. So five years from now, Mary's not going to be in labor still. I'm assuming she's in labor because I haven't heard from her. Has anybody heard from her? Well, I turned off my phone. How would I hear from her? Anyway, if you've not looked back, been able to look back on that event where you received Jesus, this can be the day you do that. And we'll be glad to pray with you and to rejoice with you. If, uh, if God's Holy Spirit is calling you, wooing you to himself. But this is your time to respond to what he would have you to do. So come, do what he wants you to do as we sing.